Welcome to the 2021 Sportsman's Forum webinar series. Uh, my name is Craig Highfield. I'm with the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. And, and so really the, the purpose of this four-part series uh, is to engage, you know, hunters and anglers who really are the, the Bay Area's greatest conservationists um, uh, into specific topics uh, of through hunting and fishing uh, of certain game species. Uh, you know, without healthy habitats, uh, for these animals, you know, it, it really affects our ability to do what we love and then it's to, to hunt and fish. Um, I'm having trouble advancing, oh, there we go. Okay, so if you're unfamiliar with the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, just wanted to let you know, um, we've been around for 50 years. We've been celebrating uh, our 50th anniversary this year. So kind of the goal of the Alliance is, is really to bring groups together to talk about real solutions for uh, the water quality uh, of the Chesapeake. Uh, we operate in, you know, we're headquartered in Annapolis, but we operate uh, throughout the Bay watershed. We have offices in Lancaster, DC, um, and Richmond, and, uh, sorry, I can't really advance. Um, so today, uh, our focus today will be waterfowl to start things off, off today. There's obviously the Chesapeake's kind of known for, for waterfowl in this area, hunting and waterfowl. So uh, we're really fortunate in, in this whole series that we have speakers from Pennsylvania, uh, also Maryland. So joining us today uh, to speak about ducks is Nate Huck. He's a waterfowl program specialist uh, with the Pennsylvania Game Commission Bureau of Wildlife Management. Uh, and to speak about uh, geese is Josh Homiak, uh, Waterfowl Project Manager with Wildlife Heritage Service at the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Uh, so feel free, we'll have plenty of times for questions today. Um, we do ask that if you do have a questions, just put it in the chat. Uh, we'll get to them, you know, maybe after each talk. And we have plenty of times uh, for the, to answer questions and they're more than willing to, to answer the questions, or even if this runs long, is to answer questions by email later. Um, so kind of without further ado, I'm going to uh, call up Nate to share. He's going to stop sharing here and have him share a screen to do the, the first presentation. So Nate, if you're there. Yeah, thanks, Craig. I'm just going to get things pulled up here. So hopefully you all can see my screen. Yes, we can. Perfect. <laughs> All righty. Um, yeah. So, hello, everybody. As uh, as Craig said, uh, my name is Nate Huck. I'm the Waterfowl Program Specialist with the Bureau of Wildlife Management uh, and the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Uh, today, I'm going to start us off uh, with the status of waterfowl presentations and just kind of focusing in on ducks. So, you know, I'm sure uh, some of you are wondering, you know, what am I going to do with this presentation today? Uh, so first, we're going to discuss what ducks we're specifically talking about. I'm going to uh, briefly address the drought that, you know, some of you have heard about and that uh, how it may or may not affect you. Um, I'm going to discuss the surveys we use to estimate waterfowl populations. Uh, and particularly ducks. And then I'll jump to into those five core species that I uh, am going to cover today and their status. So first, uh, what ducks are we really, really talking about? Um, so a lot of you have probably seen various band recovery maps before. So this map shows the original banding location. The one on the left here shows the original banding location of the five kind of core species that I've chosen to cover today, mallards, black ducks, green winged teal, uh, pintails, and wood ducks uh, that were shot in both Pennsylvania and Maryland, uh, and then recovered uh, in those, or, and then, yeah, recovered since 2010. So this includes a little over 11,000 recoveries total. Um, about 7,200 of those recoveries are mallards, uh, 1,900 of those recoveries are wood ducks, 
1,500 are black ducks and 300 recoveries are green wing teal. And then lastly, 39 of those recoveries are northern pintails. So you can see on the right, uh, just kind of a general basic uh, depiction of, of the Atlantic flyway and uh, kind of the orientation of, of the bay uh, within that. Um, and you'll see that uh, that map on the left and the map on the right map match up pretty well, except for the kind of these areas further up north where we just simply can't get to ban ducks. So, um, yeah, I'd say the banning uh, that map on the right, while pretty basic, is pretty representative. So zooming in a little bit more, what we're really, really talking about here is these uh, kind of uh, northeast birds. Um, that last map really didn't capture this very well, but this one does. This is shows those locations more zoomed in, and you can see there's a major concentration of those birds is in Pennsylvania, and then that eastern shore of Maryland, as well as you know places in in New York, you know the Finger Lakes, as well as a lot of New Jersey and uh, southern Ontario. And so, I, I guess I would like to point out that you know this is also just where banding happens you know we don't have a lot of places in you know, kind of north central northeast or northwestern pa where we ban ducks there simply just isn't a lot of places to ban ducks or um and you know that doesn't mean that there's no ducks in in you know kind of that southwestern maine but um they just don't ban there um but yeah that this kind of core area southern ontario pennsylvania maryland is really what we're talking about here so with that, I kind of want to jump, and it seems, as I just said, it, it, it's kind of irrelevant, but I, I, it is something I want to cover because it is something we get questions about pretty frequently. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of these drought conditions, you know, that darker color being more severe drought here in the West. And uh, this is kind of that core breeding range here in the Dakotas and the Prairie Provinces of Canada for, for a lot of the mid-continent. And so a lot of people are very, very concerned about those waterfowl populations uh, because of this pretty severe drought that they haven't seen in a couple of decades. Um, but uh, as I mentioned before, for, for the East Coast here, that really doesn't affect us. Most of our birds don't come from there. You know, they, they come from, from that core area there where you can see there's pretty much no, no drought whatsoever. Um, and even this greater area up there, you can see there's in 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 Quebec. You really see there's 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 no drought um, except for maybe the St. Lawrence Valley. So, with uh, you know, unless you're making a trip out to North Dakota or to the Prairie Provinces of Canada, the drought really you know isn't going to, for the most part, affect us here on the East Coast. So, what surveys? do we use to estimate waterfowl populations and specifically ducks? Um, you know, taking a look here, this zoomed in, this green area is what we refer to as our Eastern Bee Pop Survey or our Breeding Waterfowl Survey. It include, includes these portions of Ontario, Quebec, the Maritimes and Maine. And uh, to the west, you know, you can see that core area of where the Bee Pop has been going on for a lot longer. But as I said, those those really don't include too many uh, Atlantic flyway birds, except for pintails, which I will cover. Uh, there's actually another portion of the BPOP, which is the Canadian Wildlife Services Helicopter Plot Surveys. Uh, these are small blocks that you can see uh, on the screen, you know, these tiny little ones. And that's really to get an idea of, you know, zoomed in view of, of what's happening with black ducks. So... One thing I do want to address is that neither of these two surveys has happened the last two years due to COVID. Um, question we get quite frequently is why couldn't, you know, there was no Canadian pilots and people who could ID ducks. And I, I kind of want to address that too really quickly is that there's a lot of training that goes into these surveys and these surveyors, the pilots themselves actually actively are participants in the survey. They're surveying. They're not only looking at the GPS and flying the plane, they have to look out the window and count ducks too. And so um, it's a pretty um, well-trained crew that's really going about doing these surveys. And so 
Um, that's really why it, it couldn't happen. You know, we couldn't get, we just couldn't get folks up into Canada. And so therefore the survey just couldn't happen. So the second survey that we use for, for season setting and one that did take place the last two years is the Atlantic Flyway Breeding Waterfowl Survey or this plot survey. You can see all these tiny little dots on the, on, on the screen there. Uh, those are all plots that have kind of been randomly selected on the landscape. And um, so this includes 11 um, of the Northeast states, basically everything south of Maine uh, to Virginia and excluding West Virginia. Uh, including PA and Maryland. And so biologists in all these states are going out and surveying these. Each state kind of does it a little different. Here in PA, we have 252 of those plots that we're actually checking each year. And we have over 20 biologists, including myself, that are going out and doing those. So how did I settle on those five species to cover? Um, I wanna cover this really quick before we jump into the actual status information. And so uh, really I, I ended up just kind of focusing in on what do we harvest most of? You know, those are gonna be the species that people are gonna care most of. And I focused in on puddle ducks because that's what we have uh, the, the best survey information for. And so um, here you can see those, those five species. And um, as you can see for both states, generally speaking, mallard is king. Uh, we harvest more of those than anything else. Um, Although the last few years in PA, wood ducks has gotten pretty close. And even in 2019-20, you can see they actually exceeded uh, the harvest, uh, estimated harvest of mallards. And um, after that, we have black ducks and green wings, which uh, fall, fall in line next. You can see it kind of varies year to year in terms of how much is, are actually harvested. Um, and then lastly, uh, it was pretty tough to, to settle in on a fifth species. Maryland ha has a lot more species diversity that they harvest um, than PA. But uh, so I just kind of uh, decided that since I'm most familiar with pintails after doing my master's work on those, we would, I'd cover them. So let's actually talk about how they're doing. Um, as a reminder, uh, we, we do set seasons a year in advance. And so we use last year's data. So the 2020 data uh, at the Atlantic Flyway meetings in last September to set our seasons that are currently in place right now, those seasons that are just opening up. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, hey, wait a second, you just said you didn't have surveys for the last two years. So what survey information are you talking about? And um, you would be correct in saying that. Um, so what we actually have here for 2020 and 2021 for both wood ducks and green wing teal is, is modeled predictions. And some of you may be really skeptical of, of you know, a model predicting waterfowl populations, but as you can see, we have 20 years of actual data uh, for, for all these species. And so, you know, we used, we have uh, some pretty sophisticated models that are predicting year out and now two years out. Um, to get um, to help us inform our season setting. So you can see that generally speaking, wood ducks are pretty much flat, stable, and as well as green wing teal and even our black ducks, there's a slight downward trend there maybe, but um, uh, pretty flat, generally speaking. The only one that really isn't doing so well is mallards. You can see up over 1500 and now declining to about a million birds. You know, that's, a, that's close to a 30%, you know, decline over that time frame. So zooming in a little bit, this is actually pairs that were, we recorded on that Northeast plot survey. So those 11 states. And you could, there you can see that, that mallard decline a little more um, closely. And you can actually see the wood ducks in the Northeast US have been generally increasing. These, uh, this green line here is the long-term average. So you can see for mallards uh, quite a bit below that long-term average and for wood ducks, you know, they've actually climbed up above that. Taking an even closer look at those mallards for those of you that are really interested in them and probably some of you have seen those bag limit reductions and try trying to make sense of that. Um, mallards have been declining pretty steadily in the Northeast US, uh, that blue line there for the past 20 years. 
and uh, and actually have decreased about 50 percent there um while the eastern canada has just been chugging along you know about the same numbers over time so there's probably multiple factors in the decline um and i don't think we can really put our our finger on any one of them but uh i will at the end of this presentation kind of address address some future plans um to figure that out so pintails or uh, no peas as i uh, affectionately refer to them uh they're the last species that i'm going to cover so they are a nationwide stock meaning um the birds that they're shooting in California are generally the same population that we're shooting here on the East Coast. Um, and that's probably an over, overly simplistic way to look at it, but that's kind of how we manage them. So generally they've been declining since about the 1970s, although there's some anecdotal evidence, especially in the spring that they have been increasing in the Atlantic flyway. Uh, as I kind of mentioned already, their core breeding range is, is the Eastern Dakotas up into this Prairie Coteau in Alberta and Saskatchewan. And uh, you can see much of the Atlantic flyways really just fly over country for them, although they do winter, you know, here in the Chesapeake. Um, and like I said, we've been seeing bigger and bigger numbers uh, in New York and PA. Um, but that core breeding range for them does kind of line up right here with that uh, um, with that really bad drought there in the prairies. And so, and here's those population, uh, their popu general population. You can see uh, after peaking in the kind of the early 70s, there was generally kind of like a an agricultural shift. Northern pintails really like nesting and really, really low nesting cover, similar to uh, say wheat stubble, which, so those birds are going up there, they're nesting in that wheat stubble, and then farmers are coming in and, and, and uh, turning over that wheat stubble in time for planting and, and destroying the nests in the process. And pintails, unlike mallards, just don't have a propensity to keep trying to re-nest. They throw out one nest, maybe two, and they're done. And so that's kind of let, been a big thing that drove those populations down. You can see they did peak over 4 million here in about 2010 or 2011, but they've been kind of steadily declining again since. So before anybody jumps all over me, I know that is a black duck in the photo. Um, but uh, as I alluded to earlier in the presentation, we are looking at a, pro we're going to begin a project here um, that's including 22 project partners uh, from South Carolina all the way to uh, Maine and the Maritimes and Ontario and Quebec, as well as PA and Maryland. Um, that's going to be investigating the migration ecology and uh, demographics of eastern mallards. So this is going to be a flyway wide project with plans to mark over a thousand female mallards with transmitters. Uh, similar to this one, you can see here on this female American black duck in the photo. So that, that weighs about 20 grams and you can see there's an elevated solar panel on there. Uh, so the, the transmitter can get some recharge. So to give an, an example of what these devices are capable of, uh, here's a map of spring migration by a black duck we marked here in Southeast PA. In late March and early April, the bird started moving north, took a brief hiatus here in Northeast PA before it jumped up and uh, jumped over Lake Ontario into Southern, uh, Southern Ontario. It actually hit the uh, snow and ice line there. So after a brief stay there, it jumped over to Georgian Bay and then up where it settled uh, in kind of that Southern Ontario, South Central Ontario area. And um, we do know that the bird actually nested, uh, but failed. So uh, I'm sure one of some of you are wondering, well, how the heck can you tell from locations that the bird nested? Um, these devices are actually really, really sophisticated. Uh, not only do they tell you where it is, but they have a measurement device called an accelerometer. And so that takes measurements very, very quickly. And then we can look at those measurements and compare it to, we had a bunch of birds marked in captivity and look at their behaviors. And so we can actually look at what that accelerometer the readings on that accelerometer and know what the bird is doing at any given moment. 
in the past to be able to gain that type of information. We would sit in, you know, blinds with spotting scopes for hours and hours in the cold and the wet in the marsh. And now I can log into my computer and tell you where a bird is and what it's doing right now. Um, and that's really, really great for these, when these birds go up into these places that are completely inaccessible to us and uh, we can still know exactly what they're doing. So for the Mallard project, we're gonna aim to measure some of these reproductive metrics such as nesting attempts and success and survival rates. And we're gonna quantify movements and habitat use throughout the year. And um, you know, we, we're really hoping that the results of this project are gonna better inform Mallard management in the flyway and provide insight into the Mallard decline. And with that, I guess, uh, Thanks for your time and uh, yeah, we can open it up to questions. Uh, feel free everyone, if you want to put questions uh, in the chat, but we did have uh, one question here. It's just from your perspective, what are the top three factors for mallard decline? Do you, do you feel you're leaning towards? You know, I think that's a, <laughs> That's a bigger question mark than I really could probably put a put an answer on. I mean, we do we do know from banding data that um, you know some of there's some survival issues, particularly with juveniles. Um, why that is, I you know I don't I don't think we can really I, I don't think myself or or Josh would be willing to to to, to commit to anything at this point in time. So yeah, that's a tough question to answer. And I'm really hoping that this project, yeah, is gonna help us answer that. Okay, uh, the, the next question, uh, in regards to mallards uh, with the 20 year decline, in your opinion, why did it take so long to increase data collection on them? Yeah, I, I think that was one of those um, where we maybe took uh, a really prolific um, species for granted for a little bit. You know, we, we, we thought they were um, going to, it was something they were just going to kind of pull out of. Um, and then it kind of got to this breaking point where we really started to, you know, worry about them. You know, it, they are species that, you know, they're our most banded species, as I kind of mentioned um, uh, before, you know, 7,200 of the 11,000 band recoveries and PA in Maryland are mallards. So they're a really well banded species. So we have a lot of monitoring data on them. So I think we, we thought we had all the answers and um, we couldn't really detect any, any changes in the, in the things that we were observing over time. So um, I think we, now it's kind of time to try and maybe spend a little more time and effort to try and figure out what's going on. Okay. I'll just jump into here. I think with the the telemetry project, I mean the the cost, the the technology, and the cost of that technology has gotten to the point where it makes a study like you know Nate said that we're getting ready to undertake. It makes it feasible. Whereas in the past and in the relatively recent past, it wasn't as as feasible to do that. You know, financially and and data wise, um, but. Certainly, there's been a lot of banding and, and research done for mallards other than these uh, these upcoming telemetry projects. So I didn't mean to jump on you, Nate. I just thought that was worth saying. Yeah, that's a good point, Josh. Yeah, I mean, as an example, these these devices are, you know, while they cost $1,200, we can still get our, you know, locations on these birds. Whereas in the past, you know, we were paying 2000 or more dollars for maybe two locations a day. So, it, you know... Yeah, it's, it's really, we've really changed the scale of what these devices are capable of. Well, great. Well, thank you. Uh, Jenna, you might need to help me here. Uh, Theodore McKeldin, you had a hand raised. Did you have a question? And I don't know if you want to ask it. Uh, Jenna, Jenna, can you? Yeah, I just, I just gave them permission to, to speak if you'd like. Okay, Theodore, did you have a question you wanted to ask? You may be on mute. If... if not, feel free to type your question in the chat. Excellent. Well, the, a, another question for you, though, is, you know, for hunters down here, kind of in this mid-Atlantic region, you know, with the decline on certain species being, you know, probably in, the, in their summer grounds, is there stuff that, you know, 
could be done down here that would improve that or, or, or is it stuff we can do down here where we just maintain a, a good population? Yeah, I, I think, you know, as we're, we're thinking about um, wintering birds, you know, winter, you know, good habitat management and things like that. Uh, providing quality habitat is always important. You know, that's one of the most stressful times of the year for these birds. Um, and one of the most important times of the year, you know, we, we know that um, that February, March timeframe is really important for these birds that are going to be nesting in April and May. So yeah, providing quality habitats and keeping things uh, in good condition is probably, you know, the best we can do at this point. Um, well, great. Um, and, and then I guess another thing, you guys had a difficult task of, of a species that, that migrates great distances, especially into another country. So how's that been? It seems like there's a lot of coordination with these efforts among states, the federal government, and then I guess in, in Canada, even, even the provincial governments. It, it, I mean, do you feel that that's going well? Is it, is it being inhibited by politics or, or what? Or how can you describe that process or, at all? Sure, and I'll invite Josh to jump in if, if, I, if I do a poor job of saying anything here, but, you know, we have annual, two times a year, we, we meet annually with not only the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but all 17 Atlantic Flyway states and Canadian Wildlife Services. We have great partnerships with all of those folks, and so, yeah, there's constant uh, cooperation and negotiation, like I said, you know, for this Mallard Project, uh, all the, the Maritimes and Canadian Wildlife Services and Ontario and Quebec are all involved in this project, as well as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So um, I would consider, you know, waterfowl management kind of one of the models for how, um, you know, agencies can kind of interact and, and, and um, you know, work together and, and manage a cooperative group of species. Well, excellent. No, no, that's great. It's a, it's, it's a big task. It's great. Okay. Um, well, if you do have any questions about ducks in particular, maybe we'll, we'll do it after Josh's presentation, but I, I like to switch gears uh, and uh, send it over to Josh. Uh, so Nate, if you just want to stop sharing, I guess, and Josh, you can throw yours up. All right. Um, in there so uh there we go everybody can see that and, and hear yes. me right okay yes. yeah so good evening everyone i'm josh homiak waterfowl project manager for the maryland department of natural resource or wildlife and heritage service um and uh doing the alliance for the bay sportsman's forum tonight so this is this is great and we appreciate the invite and i'm um, excited to participate and as nate as we said earlier, he's kind of covering the, the duck um, status update, and, and I'm going to cover, uh, cover geese. So, you know, first when we were talking about this, we said, um, you know, that Nate and I were, were talking um, about how we were going to attack this, uh, this invite tonight and sticking geese and you know, Nate was going to do ducks and I was going to do geese. And of course, I was thinking Canada geese. And then it kind of dawned on me, well, we have couple other species of uh, geese that use the Atlantic Flyway in Maryland too. So it was kind of a, a moment there where I had to smack myself in the forehead. But um, so the goose species that we have, the primary ones that, um, that we manage for in the Atlantic Flyway and of course, Pennsylvania and Maryland, we have Canada geese and there's three main populations, Atlantic population, or what we commonly refer to as the AP Canada geese. And they nest in Northern Quebec and migrate south and predominantly winter in southeast PA and the Delmarva Peninsula south to uh, northeastern uh, North Carolina with the Delmarva Peninsula being the core of the wintering range. There's a, another population of um, subarctic nesting geese called the North Atlantic population or NAP geese and they nest in the Canadian Maritimes and migrate south as well but not nearly as far, they end up wintering in southern New England and, and Long Island and maybe just to the northern part of New Jersey. And then, um, of course, there's resident geese or what we call RP geese. And generally, uh, from a sort of regulatory uh, standpoint, 
we consider anything that nests south of 48 degrees north and east of 80 degrees west, which is, which is a good little ways north of Montreal. Anything south of there is considered a resident goose. And these, um, the Canadians refer to these, I think they have a little um, better name for these geese. They call them temperate nesting geese whereas the other two species are subarctic nesting geese. And we call them resident geese, and it's kind of misleading because they do migrate, um, especially in, in harsher winters, They'll, they will move south, um, but their migrations are typically not nearly as pronounced as long distant migrations of the Atlantic and North Atlantic populations. And, and these resident geese um, mostly were um, they descend from flocks that were placed here by humans. Um, they uh, are, you know, used to be able to buy geese to put on your pond. Um, when live decoys were legal, hunters had flocks of, of resident geese and, and um, when that became illegal, they turned them loose. And state agencies, um, uh, state and federal agencies placed geese. And these are all mostly, um, subspecies from the central part of the continent, uh, giant Canada geese and um, some other larger subspecies that were um, uh, placed here to try to establish resident goose populations uh, really for hunting opportunity and, and for wildlife viewing and things like that as well. Um, but that population eventually uh, just exploded, you know, being further to south and not having to migrate, their um, reproductive potential is a lot higher. And um, in a lot of cases, they become problems. You know, they uh, in, inhabit residential areas and cause a lot of agricultural damage. In residential areas, they're pooping all over the place, of course, and can chase people and harass people. And um, um, so we have a little more liberal hunting seasons on, on those birds. Uh, the other two species of geese that we see um, you know, mostly in PA and Maryland are greater snow geese. We do. There are some lesser snow geese that winter in the Atlantic flyway, but not really very many of them. Uh, greater snow geese nest further north than the, uh, even than the AP Canada geese, mostly on islands in the Eastern Canadian Arctic. Then there's Atlantic brant, which are small goose, and they nest on islands in the Eastern Canadian Arctic as well. And um, winter on the East Coast, you know, predominantly around Long Island and New Jersey, but, but south to uh, North Carolina. Greater snow geese are wintering, kind of skipped over where they winter, but um, Delmarva Peninsula and south to um, Virginia and North Carolina as well be the core of their wintering range. So just to give an idea of, um, of where these uh, locations are, you know, you can, on this map in the lower right-hand corner, you can see the, uh, you can see my cursor, of course, you can see the Chesapeake Bay. This RP symbol is about right over Pennsylvania. So these greater snow geese and Atlantic brant are nesting way up here above the Arctic Circle. The AP Canada geese nest primarily on this large peninsula. It's called the Ungava Peninsula. This is the Ungava Bay to the east, and the Hudson Bay to the west. And the NAP geese are nesting over here in the Canadian Maritimes. And just for some scale, uh, Chestertown, Maryland, which is maybe the, the heart of the AP goose uh, wintering area to their nesting um, area on the, probably the heart of their nesting area along the Hudson Bay coast near Pavirnatuk and Nunavik, which is a, an area of Northern Quebec is about 1500 miles. So that's a, that's a pretty long jog for these birds to take uh, twice a year every year. And of course, the snow geese and, and brand are, are, you know, doing going a little further than that. So we, we talked at the at the end of Nate's talk there. Uh, we were talking about the cooperation between um, um, really, you know, the two countries here. These are international resource, and and uh, so we need cooperation between the U.S. and Canada, and the and the states and provinces. And we, we really do have great cooperation. Um, you know, it's it's. Uh, pretty remarkable the relationships we have with the biologists in the other states, with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Canadian Wildlife Service. Of course, you know, occasionally you're going to have a different objectives and you're going to butt heads over things, but um, um, there's, there's a lot of respect and excellent cooperation between all those states and governments um, in, 
in managing these birds. And uh, as I would agree 100% with Nate, that this is really kind of a model on, on how to do things. Um, and with those cooperative monitoring programs, we have things divided up by species, and a lot of them are kind of similar uh, between the species, as you might expect. But um, AP Canada geese, Atlantic population Canada geese that nest on the Ngava Peninsula, we have a, a I have a nesting pair here, it should be breeding pair survey. Um, that's an aerial survey that's done every spring or had been done every spring until 2020, um, since I think like 1997. Um, and that uh, gives us an estimate of the number of breeding pairs and the total population of uh, AP Canada geese. And that's conducted on the breeding grounds in the Ngava Peninsula. It's a very remote country up there. It looks like the, the picture on the right here. Um, and it's a series of transects that are flown and count geese. The other um, thing we use to uh, monitor these birds is an annual banding program. And these birds, um, we capture and band them on the uh, nesting grounds up there on the Ungava Peninsula. Typically from the US, we'd send about four people up there and the uh, Canadians would provide the uh, rest, two teams, one on the Ungava Bay Coast and one on the Hudson Bay Coast. And you fly around in helicopters and locate molting flocks of geese that contain young birds. You herd them up at the helicopter, drop some people off and set up a temporary pen, like we're looking at here in this picture and capture and band the geese. And all these banding programs, not only do you get bands on the birds, which allows us um, when these birds are harvested and reported to assess um, not only migration routes, but harvest and survival rates. Um, we're also getting a, um, a young to a, or, yeah, a young to adult ratio every year. So that kind of gives us an index of how well the hatch was for, for all these species or how well they, they did nesting that particular year. Uh, for RP Canada geese, it's a, a little bit different. The Atlantic Flyway Breeding Waterfowl Survey that Nate referenced for um, the duck species is the primary uh, survey that we use to um, create RP Canada goose, resident population Canada goose uh, estimates annually. And those were not really, um, um, through the past couple of years uh, with COVID, most of those surveys were able to be completed by the, by the states um, without any you know, without really missing much data there. A few little, few little hiccups, but, um, but really pretty good, especially in 2021, basically back to normal. Um, we also ban these geese throughout their nesting range. The geese um, appear very similar morphologically. The, uh, generally speaking, the AP geese are gonna be a little bit smaller, but there's enough overlap between these two populations of geese that makes it, can often make it very difficult to tell them apart even in hand. So to truly identify them, you have to ban these birds on their nesting ground where you know basically they're, they're local to that area. And so that's why we have these, these banding programs uh, for Canada geese that are specific to these uh, the areas where they nest really. For greater snow geese, uh, there's an annual spring photo survey that's conducted by the Canadian Wildlife Service. Um, the majority of the greater snow geese stage in the St. Lawrence River. And they take, um, they try to photograph as many of these, you know, greater snow geese uh, when they're migrating, they're in large flocks. And so they can pretty much take pictures of most of the population of these geese um, and within, I think they try to do most of it within one day, so they're not double counting on the St. Lawrence River. And then they basically take those photos and, and count geese in the photo to get an annual spring uh, population estimate. It's also banding for greater snow geese on the nesting grounds. In Atlantic Brant, uh, we uh, conduct a midwinter survey, which are ground and aerial surveys to get a population estimate for Brant. And because where they're nesting, it's, it's so remote, it's very difficult to do aerial surveys for them. And, and we also do a productivity survey in the, uh, in the winter when these birds, or late fall and winter when these birds arrive. And that's their plumage. The plumage of the young birds is different enough that biologists can look at a flock and count young and old birds and develop a productivity index uh, annually for them as well. 
There is some banding on the nesting grounds for Atlantic Brant, as well as a number of research projects, which are placing leg bands and color markers and transmitters on Brant uh, on, the, um, on the wintering grounds too. So for estimating harvest for all species, and, and this really uh, includes the duck species too, the Fish and Wildlife Service conducts uh, a couple surveys. One's a diary survey where they, uh, they send hunt diaries out to hunters and it's a voluntary participation um, where hunters basically keep track of the days they hunt and, and what species they shot and they return those to the Fish and Wildlife Service at the end of the year. And, and that's a, the main method that harvest is estimated. Uh, sort of a, an accompanying survey to that diary is the parts collection survey, or maybe some of you that are that are hunters on this uh, forum tonight have gotten wing envelopes from the Fish and Wildlife Service, where uh, hunters take wings from birds or with geese. It's um, uh, they snip off the primary feathers and the tail. Uh, with ducks, it's a wing, and you put them in an envelope provided by the Fish and Wildlife Service and, and mail them to the service. And they have what's called wing bees where biologists sit around in a room and look at all these tails and wings and you can identify them by species, of course, and sex and age those. So it gives um, sex and age ratios of the birds and the harvest in that particular year, which is, which is kind of a double check um, on some of the, uh, the other data collection streams that I covered above. So we talked sort of at length already about the monitoring issues caused by COVID-19. Um, you know, as Nate said, the U.S.-Canada border was closed from spring 2020 to August 21. And there's many other work restrictions within the states and, and provinces related to COVID. You know, as, as we know, that's been, been tough to track and, and follow as, as everybody's trying to figure this thing out. Um, it, was, it was no less difficult for us as we were trying to figure out what what work we were allowed to do and, and what work we weren't. Um, and long story short, uh, no surveys or banding were conducted for Arctic or subarctic nesting species in 2020 and, and 21. And, and that's, um, that's all these uh, goose species with the exception of the uh, RP, the resident Canada geese. So, you know, what do we do without normal monitoring? And, and, monitoring? and, and Nate kind of covered this, covered it well, but you know, for the most part, most of the state side work was relatively unaffected. We were able to conduct the Atlantic Flyway Breeding Waterfowl Survey, where those RP Canada goose estimates come from, as well as a mallard and black duck and, and wood duck estimates. Uh, most states were able to conduct RP Canada goose banding in both years. Um, some in Maryland, we could not do it in 2020, but we did uh, do it just normal fashion, more or less. Um, this year, so that was really good. Uh, harvest estimates were able to be um, uh, garnered pretty much unaffected. And we have remotely sensed weather data, which is particularly important for um, some of these Arctic and subarctic nesting uh, goose species. So we kind of take all this together and we use these scientifically sound mathematical models to provide population estimates for monitoring and regulatory purposes. These uh, the models, as Nate said, it makes a lot of us kind of scratch our head. Um, they can be difficult and complicated, but you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of, um, they're looking at the number of births and the number of deaths and, and predicting that based on what we've seen in these long-term data sets. In some of the cases, you know, going back 50 or 60 or more years. And that gives these models a lot of power to, to estimate um, populations even in the absence of, of new data. We, we would love to have new data to plug into them and the new data makes them a lot better, there's no doubt. Um, but the fact that we have them is, is a real lifesaver in, in a time like this. And we really hope um, to get you know, back to a normal data stream plugged into these models next year. So getting into kind of some more specifics, um, this is what the, um, population graph looks like in the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service 2021 status report for greater snow geese. Um, the spring photo survey, again, the kind of last two years of the survey are gonna be model derived because the spring photo survey fell victim to COVID in 2020 and 2021. 
Um, you can see this long-term data set shows a stable population since 2000. And I, I just, you know, to me, 2000 doesn't sound that long ago, but when you think about it, you know, here we are 2021. So that's been a pretty stable population with stable, relatively stable hunting regulations since 2000. So, you know, common sense is, is going to tell you it's reasonable to assume that stability uh, to continue. Uh, a positive, real positive note for snow geese is uh, Arctic research activities opened up on August 1st. Um, the Canadian government opened those research activities up and a small team uh, accessed Bylot Island to ban greater snow geese and relatively limited sampling, but yielded an average number of young birds, 21% uh, of fall flight, which is, is pretty close to the long-term long -term average. So it was good to see that some researchers got up there and, and did at least a small part of the annual work that we're used to getting done. Um, and also good to see um, a relatively um, uh, good nesting effort from those birds. So resident population Canada geese, uh, population estimates, Atlantic Flyway Breeding Waterfowl Survey, which as I mentioned, was conducted in 2020 and 21, normal banding operations in 2021 for all states. Um, you can see that population graph for those birds has been pretty stable for a long time and a little bit over a million birds. And that's, um, you know, one of the reasons why you see more liberal bag limits for um, zones where we can for these resident uh, Canada geese really throughout the flyway and, and southern Canada. Atlantic Brant um, population index this is from um, midwinter survey data just for the most part an aerial survey that's flown by states where Brant uh, winter. The Fish and Wildlife Service, well, the midwinter survey was conducted normally in 2020. That was sort of before uh, all the COVID stuff hit. The modified survey was completed in 2021. So not too much um, affected here for Atlantic Brant. And there is uh, an integrated population model that provides estimates um, you know, for this uh, population as well. So this uh, productivity that I mentioned, um, productivity survey that I mentioned earlier was also conducted normally in 2020. Hasn't happened yet this year because um, birds for the most part have not gotten here yet. So Atlantic population Canada geese, and, and these are the, the subarctic nesting birds, you know, kind of the iconic migratory Canada goose. Um, you know, that we all wait to see in the fall, or at least if you're a hunter or a, a birder, um, you know, that's what you're waiting for. And, and we hear those, those faint honks high in the sky from those birds that are migrating at altitude. That's a, that's a sign that uh, falls here for sure. Um, from a monitoring standpoint, as we mentioned, the spring breeding pair survey and banding effort was canceled for the past two years. Uh, that's the first time stuff like this has happened in a long, long time. Um, for these birds, though, this, the long-term data that we do have has shown that the spring weather data is a very good predictor of productivity. The, the hatch is directly tied to the spring weather. It's, the, the graphs show it, and it's just kind of one of those things that there's no doubt about it. It's rare that you see such a smoking gun in, in this type of work, but it's, it's clearly the thing for these birds. Um, average conditions on the Ungava Peninsula in spring 2021 uh, would allow us to predict average reproductive success for AP geese and, and, you know, maybe even a little bit above average. This map on the left here, uh, this shows the Ungava Peninsula and these, whereas Nate's map was showing drought, these dark orange and, and yellow uh, colors here and, and even purple further north. That's snow cover, and this is on May 31st in 2021. So you can see there's still a fair amount of snow cover that far north. Um, however, this is kind of a normal year, and these coastal zones on the Hudson Bay side and the Ungava Bay side, those are the primary areas where these birds nest. There's a fair amount that nest in the interior, but, but these are the goose producing areas uh, for this population of geese. There's, there's some, some big river valleys and, and nicer habitat. Um, nesting and brood rearing habitat in these areas. Um, so that's where they are. And you can see those were fairly snow free by May 31st. And that's kind of what we're looking at when we're saying average conditions. This is um, average May temperature 
uh, going back to the mid 90s. And you can see the observed average, this is Celsius is 1.54. So just a little bit above freezing. And, and this year it was 3.4. That number was driven up a little bit by some extremely warm days at the very end of the month. So it's from a practical standpoint, it's probably a little bit lower than that. But that you know, shows a graph of weather conditions. Anybody who follows the status of this population of geese knows that in 2018, um, was, was a, that was a big bust for the hatch that year. It was abnormally record-breaking uh, cold and snow and ice in, in that spring. And even when our banding crews went up in August, there was still snow laying around in some of the sheltered areas, which is, which is unusual even, even for that far north. So, um, you know, you can see that particular year, the average temperature was well below normal, followed by a year where it was well above. Last year was was not a very good one either, and this year above normal. So um, then the, the hatch for these birds followed suit. And you really, if you look at the, the last 10 years or so, you can see there's a lot more below average than above average, and that led to some population declines and restrictions in, in harvest um, you know, through the restrictions in the hunting season in the AP zones, states that hunt these geese. So this is a chart that shows the number of breeding pairs. And as I said, you know, you looked at that last chart or the last 10 years and, um, you know, below average breeding conditions. And, you know, you look at the last 10 years or so of this chart, you can see a general downward, downward trend. Although at the end here, it's, it's leveled off and, and we hope should be starting to climb. The model, um, you know, given the, the reduced harvest that we've implemented with shortened hunting seasons and reduced bag limits, um, the model is gonna predict, um, you know, a little bit of growth in that population and that's what we're seeing. Hopefully we get up there to document that this spring um, and conduct the breeding pair survey and, and kind of, um, you know, ground truth this uh, model prediction. So the effects on, on all these things for the uh, 2021 goose hunting season. So um, actually I should say uh, 2022, the 2021 goose season is they're set. Um, it's a, a typo on my part and I apologize for that. But the federal frameworks for all the Atlantic flyway goose species will remain unchanged for the 2022-23 season. So that'd be next year. You know, we're using this population data and model predictions that we have for this year to, um, to implement the hunting seasons for next year. And that's not only for geese, but for ducks and other migratory game birds, woodcock and morning doves as well. But states have, the, have individual processes for determining the specific season dates and bag limits within the boundaries set by the framework. So generally speaking, um, as hunters, we can, we can bet that the seasons are gonna be fairly similar uh, to, to what we have currently uh, in 2022, um, but states have their individual processes. In Maryland, we're just beginning it. We vet these, um, these seasons through um, a couple citizens advisory committees and the Wildlife Advisory Commission, and we have a long public comment period um, on our proposed hunting seasons that will come out of these federal framework. So over the next couple months, we'll be, we'll be running through that process. And then by April, we'll know what the actual hunting seasons are going to be for 22-23 season. Nate had a research slide for ducks, and we have some um, similar exciting stuff coming up for Canada geese. Um, instead of uh, the backpack transmitters that um, Nate showed us a picture of on the dock for geese because they're larger with transmitters are, are incorporated into a neck collar. And that's what you see on the, the neck of this Canada goose. And there's a few that have been put on over the past few years, kind of for a different research project, but it's, it's actually served as a great uh, kind of uh, preliminary project for what we have planned in the next three years. These are also solar power powered. They're solar panels that are built into that, uh, that neck collar and allow it to recharge. Um, we're gonna place about 125 collars per year for the next three years. It'd be starting next year uh, on AP Canada geese. Most of the neck collars will be placed on the nesting grounds. 
um, some on the wintering grounds, but it's really going to allow us to to reassess migrations and pathways and timings. And, and um, uh, you know, we feel like we have a pretty pretty solid idea what that is through the uh, through the band return data. I mean, for AP Canada geese over the past twenty or more years, there's been over a hundred thousand bands applied to these birds up, up here on the nesting ground. So that's a pretty big sample. Um, and um, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, of band returns, you know, mostly by hunters. But these these neck collars are going to collect data in a manner very similar to what Nate described for ducks. Um, you can see this is a pathway of a goose that winters near Rehoboth. Um, kind of comes to the same pond every year in Rehoboth. A lot of these these geese exhibit a lot of site fidelity on both ends of the migration. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and uh, and winters up here on the uh, Ungava Bay side of the uh, Ungava Peninsula, and this represents three migrations. You can see six kind of strings of spaghetti going back and forth there. So um, that's a that's a lot of data points for one collar, and we're going to be putting a lot of those collars out over the next few years. And and just like the the duck projects, we're real excited to to see what kind of information that's going to produce. So for the goose species, um, that's really about all I have and um, be happy to take any questions at this point. Excellent. Uh, well, thanks a lot, Josh. Appreciate that. that was wonderful information. So if you do have any questions, please put it in the chat. Um, I, I will start with one is what we're noticing is uh, the resident geese population. Um, mm -hmm. Affecting, you know, the 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 migrating ones, especially for habitat and, and food. Are you seeing, you know, major problems with that? Because it does seem like the, you know, populations are expanding of the resident geese. Yeah, I mean, the population estimates are, are you know, fairly stable. Um, you know, that's one of the concerns with the, I, I don't know specifically about habitat, but one of the concerns with the um, uh, reductions in the seasons for AP geese and the, you know, goose hunting or goose management has hunting opportunity divided up into various zones throughout the throughout the states and, and provinces. And the zones where AP geese travel, migrate through and winter, um, there's generally more restrictive hunting seasons, less hunting opportunity. Mm -hmm. However, there's a lot of resident geese that inhabit those areas too and get harvested during the AP goose season. You know, just because a goose is shot in an AP hunting zone, that doesn't mean that it's an AP goose. It could well be a, a migrant goose. You know, as a as a hunter, you you certainly can't tell um, in hunting circumstances, and and you really don't care. You know, from a hunting standpoint, a, a goose is a goose. But from a management standpoint, you know, reducing harvest of those um, RP Canada geese in the kind of AP hunt zones, uh, that you know, there's a lot of fear that that's going to um, um, you know, allow for some expansion in those areas. And, and I don't think there's, there's much, you know, from a, a wintering habitat standpoint, um, you know, maybe you could make that case in some localized areas. I don't think so in a more widespread sense. Um, so, yeah, I'm just thinking a second, but that's, um, something else pops into my head I'll, I'll plug it in there but okay no that's great in, in that was just to, as a follow-up have the harvest of, of resident geese gone up you know in pennsylvania and maryland's you know within the last decade or so are more and more people engaging in that early season well th there's there's uh right there's several seasons there's an early september season in uh most states that targets resident geese and then there's um there's late seasons too, and and those are popular seasons. And right offhand, um, I don't have the harvest information right in mm -hmm. front of me. My my thinking, and and maybe Nate, if uh, you can jump in here and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm thinking is that it's pretty stable. Um, and actually, in Maryland, that's not true. It's been declining, and we think that's mostly just due to um, some of those management efforts stabilizing and, and maybe even pushing that resident population down a little bit, which is, you know, that's the goal of those liberal hunting seasons. And, you know, the goal is to use hunting 
to reduce conflict with the agricultural community, you know, suburban and urban communities that, that, you know, have problems with those geese. We'd much rather use, use hunting and use those birds as a hunting opportunity to control them than, you know, doing a uh, goose roundup or some other kind of, uh, you know, removal like that. Okay, excellent. Uh, a question came in uh, from a Chesapeake Bay perspective. Do you anticipate uh, a reduction in bag limits by those jurisdictions that you had mentioned? By those jurisdictions. So I guess different states can set, you know, different bag limits. I guess. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, yep. So now um, the the federal framework. Um, you know, we're in a restrictive package for AP Canada geese right now. Um, and that allows for a 30 day season with one bird per day. And, and that is, um, is now applied across all states that hunt AP geese. And, and that's certainly the case for this hunting season and will be the case for next hunting season as well. So um, I do not anticipate any restrictions um, below that, 30 birds and one goose. Uh, Brant can be a little bit more volatile for, for Maryland and Pennsylvania. We're not big Brant hunting States. Um, we do have, uh, uh, the few guys that pursue them down what we call our coastal bays near ocean city and the, um, you know, along the Atlantic coast, that's mostly where they're found in Maryland. Um, but those, those, fr uh, frameworks can be a little bit more volatile is that the population estimates for, for them tend to jump around a little bit more. The, you know, there's for greater snow geese, they've been um, above the population goal for a long, long time and super liberal hunting seasons. And uh, we don't anticipate that changing anytime soon for those birds either. Okay. Uh, it was a follow up question it is um, how about the bag limits uh, for early resident goose? No, don't anticipate those changing anytime soon either. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, so we will kind of open it up again just for, for general questions on, on ducks and geese. Um, well, one question I, I did have I wanted to pose out there, it, it's, it's probably tough, but with, you know, you know climate change, or, you know, especially in, in the, the summer breeding grounds, what kind of changes or reactions do you think that'll play on uh, the migrating populations? Yeah, so that's that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, there there's been, you know, we had a a, a talk uh, presented to the Flyway a meeting or two ago. Um, you know, looking at sort of the warming of the of the Arctic, and one of the zones that looks like it might be experiencing the opposite trend is the Ungava Peninsula, where it appears and the models predict like um, conditions may be going the opposite way there too. And, and that's kind of the, the weird thing about climate change. You know, some of this stuff is influenced by sea currents like the Gulf Stream and as, as they change, you know, the, the land uh, and weather that they influence may change too. So, you know, that's, um, that's kind of a, a, you know, pretty disturbing thought for this uh, population of geese and um, sort of, some other things that the uh, natives have noticed up there, which is which is kind of contradictory to to what I just said, but it's it's factual. Was um, expansion of, of some predators, particularly on the Ungava Bay side, they see a lot more black bears than, than they used to. Even you know, 10, 20 years ago, it was it was almost unheard of to see a black bear that far north, and and now they're seeing them, and and of course some. Um, you know, a black bear turned loose in a nesting colony of, of Canada geese or, or anything else is going to, going to destroy a lot of nests, you know? Um, so, so that's a change to, um, you know, how that stuff plays out in the future is it's, you know, we can, we can make predictions and, and, um, and model things and, and prepare for it. But, um, uh, you know, it's potentially some tough stuff going on there. Yeah, yeah. I never really thought about that with the, the increase of predation on on the nest there. Yeah, and and that's um, you know just changing in range of of some of these species. You sort of 
you think more about it, I, th- I think in the other direction, you know, contracting range of polar bears, and, you know, stuff like that. And, um, but with, with change, there's, there's winners and losers. Um, and in this case, it appears like the, the black bears might be on the winner side, <laughs> but this is, you know, I, Nate said the, the other challenging thing is this, this country where these birds are nesting, it's, you know, it's some of the remotest territory on the planet and, and getting information on this stuff is, is, it's, it's difficult and it's expensive. You know, there's, there's a lot of money spent on, on monitoring these geese and, and, um, uh, you know, getting researchers up there, getting biologists up there, uh, you know, supplying aviation fuel and food and, and lodging. It's, it's, it, you know, it's kind of more than a notion to do that. You just, you're not just buying a hotel ticket and, and driving your car there. Challenging conditions, to say the least. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Well, excellent. Um, any more questions for people in the chat? Uh, if not, I, I do want to take this opportunity to thank ba- both Nate and Josh for, for spending time with us on that. Those are both excellent presentations. Um, both Josh and Nate have agreed to, to share their email, and we, we can send this out uh, to participants. If you do have any follow-up questions about any of this, they're, we're grateful for that, to hand out your emails. Um, but we do think about it. This was a great session, the first session that we have. Um, let me just share my screen real quick um, for final. Um, okay, I'm just gonna, I'll put it up there. I won't put it, this slide. I just wanna let you know, this is the first of a four part series. Uh, next Wednesday, we'll be talking about wild turkey and, and the state of them in both in Pennsylvania and Maryland. Uh, November 3rd, we'll switch to the anglers and, and talk about brook trout. And uh, then we'll, we'll finish up, you know, right before the, the getting close to the firearm season for, for white-tailed deer. So we'll talk about uh, kind of the state of those as well. So uh, I appreciate your time and hope if you haven't signed up for the other three, uh, please take that opportunity to do it. We will share the recording of this. This has been recorded. We will share that for, for viewing again. Um, It'll be on our, we'll send it out, but it'll also be on the website, the Alliance's website for the Sportsman's Forum. Um, let's see, there might be one more question. Oh yeah, more information is posted. So in the chat, um, Jenna posted that to where you can find the recording and where to register for the next three. So we appreciate everyone here. Um, please reach out to us if you have any questions, um, but this is, I thought this was a very successful start. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.